Yeah, so it seems like I have to say something now. I cannot do it like you and just say I'm not saying something. So, okay, I have to do it. Well, as announced already, I'm assistant professor of decision analysis. But honestly, I'm a terrible decision maker. And actually, even I'm risking now to get fired, um, that's actually the case. Often, I behave completely opposite to my preferences and attitudes. Just let me give you an example. Actually, I hate digital pollution. Not in general, but what I don't like is that if people are constantly checking their mobile phones for new messages, particularly if you're in a conversation with others, come on, this is really unfriendly. I don't like it. Recently, I was at a restaurant and I saw a couple having kind of a candlelight dinner, so their table was slightly separated and it was not too light and not too dark, so I would say perfect condition for a romantic conversation. So these guys didn't speak a single word during the whole dinner. They were both just constantly checking their smartphones, like zombies, it was really, it was insane. So very bizarre situation, uh, but actually sometimes I catch myself doing actually the same. While I'm speaking with others, I'm kind of automatically grabbing my phone and checking for new messages. So obviously, I often behave exactly opposite to what my general attitude is. And the problem is that often uh, to transform our attitudes into actual decisions and behaviors requires a lot of cognitive effort. This is particularly the case if there are many options available or if the options are quite complicated and it's not very clear what the outcome of a certain kind of behavior will be. Or if the situation is very new to us and we have no experience uh, from our previous decisions, what is the best decision for us? Or as in the mobile phone example, sometimes it may be that our attitudes are actually overridden by some kind of automatic forces due to our usual habit, typically. So the problem is, as I said, it's the brain. So we need to put in some cognitive efforts uh, and that may be problematic in certain kind of situations. Well, what I'm going to tell you now is uh, that we often can help people quite a lot making good or at least better decisions by very simple nudges. So-called nudges are interventions that do not restrict the decision maker in any way. They do also not eliminate any of the behavioral options available and what's also very important, they do not change the economic incentives of the decision-making situation in any way. They're really very small things. They are certainly, they are not persuasive. They are also not educational. And they are definitely not coercive. Rather, they are small pushes in the direction of the decision-maker's own preference. So they are small hints, but no hammer blows. So in the mobile phone example I gave you, my friends and I have a very simple solution to the problem. When we enter to a bar or restaurant, we just put our mobile phones out of the pockets and put them in the middle of the table. So in a way, we do not restrict our behavioral options because it's still very simple to reach the phone if a call comes in. However, with this, we block this automatic zombie-like message checking. So at least us, this helps a lot. Yeah, at least the fun in our group, it helps. Well, you might now say, okay, this is a bad decision, but I do not really harm someone if I check uh, my messages at the mo mobile phone, right? But there are other situations where our bad decisions can have quite severe consequences. And not only maybe for ourselves, but even for others. And this is if we move from digital pollution to environmental pollution. So in environmental pollution, our bad, or our bad decisions may not only affect ourselves or the other people around us, but even the pe people who live after us, so our children or grandchildren. Okay, now comes the moral part. So during this talk, actually three species will get ex extinct due to the drastic environmental changes in recent years. And if you don't care about this, while I'm speaking here, there are 100 people dying due to illnesses related to outdoor air pollution. This is dramatic. So 
to avert this threat of the dangerous negative consequences of climate change, we need to change our behavior drastically and on all levels. And it's really also, we heard this earlier, it's also about our individual behaviors. It's either directly our individual behavior or indirectly by su supporting certain political agents or parties. So the question is, how can we now implement this? How can we implement simple nudges to the area of environmental and climate change protection? Well, first of all, the assumption is that people have, in general, a positive attitude towards others, towards also the people who live after us, so our children and grandchildren. And you have shown with your hand signs just before that most of you actually have this kind of uh, attitude. The problem is that we still do not behave consistent with this attitude and preference. So we investigated in an experiment in, in the laboratory how people may behave in a similar kind of situation. So basically, we invited hundreds of people to uh, a laboratory in experimental sessions of about 20 people, and they faced a situation which is, in principle, very similar to the situation of environmental and climate change. It worked as follows. So the, we divided the experimental session in several uh, groups. And these groups made, actually faced exactly the same situation, but in a sequential order. With this, we model the different generations. So every player of each group of each generation received a monetary endowment and could decide, independent of, independent of all the other members of their own group and of the other groups, what to do with their endowment. He or she could keep the money privately for him or herself. Alternatively, the people could contribute the endowment to do two different public goods. Public good contributions were actually costly, so it made, at first sight, no so sense to contribute to them. However, if your group overall did not contribute at least 50% of their endowment to the public goods, independent to which of them, there was a chance of 80% to lose all the resources. In a way, with this, we model uh, the, the prosociality and the cooperation that people have to show in order to avert the risky negative consequences of climate change. But I said there were two different public goods. So, and the costs of these two, two different public goods were different. So one was more costly to invest than the other. Of course, you would say, if at all to contribute, I would rather contribute to the cheaper one, to the cheaper option. However, with this, you actually harm the people of the subsequent generations by reducing their own monetary endowment. So, in a way, this models now the intergenerational conflict we are currently facing. There are different options. Some are rather short-term, and others may be more costly, but are long-term and have positive and no negative consequences for subsequent generations. There are many examples of these short-term versus long-term Things. For instance, if we invest in new technologies that try to reduce fuel consumption, consumption that's rather short-term. On the other hand, if we invest in new technologies building on renewable energies, that's actually a rather long-term contribution which may solve an, or may be an ultimate solution to the problem. So think about this. What would you do? Would you keep the money and hope that the other people contrib contribute sufficient amount and that they will avert the dangerous consequences? And if you actually contribute, to which pool would you contribute? Would you bear the higher individual costs which have no profit for you at all or for your own group? It's really just about the subsequent generations. Let me tell you what our participants did. Actually, in almost all groups, people contributed sufficient amounts to the pool to avert the negative consequences of climate change. That was already a surprise, so if we really are aware of the risk we are facing, people are willing to contribute. However, the more important question is whether they contributed to the short or to the long-term public good. And what we found is that almost all people rather contributed to the short-term a public good and didn't care a lot about the people playing after them, the following generations. 
So I said that we assume in general that people have a positive attitude towards others. So now nudging comes into play. If this is true, if our attitude in general at least is pro other generations, pro other people, then simple nudges, so-called green nudges, may help people make better decisions in even such a complex situation. So here's what we did. We Actually, people could do their input, how much to contribute to the long-term public good via such a kind of slider. And what we changed in one condition is that we manipulated the starting position of the slider. So the starting position was set exactly at the point which is from the intergenerational collective perspective the optimal contribution. That's all what we did. People were free actually to move the slider away. It was just the starting point that was changed. A very simple manipulation. So therefore we changed the default of the contribution decision. Additionally, we gave people some feedback. One problem in environmental and climate change protection is that we often don't see directly the negative consequences of our behaviors. So what we did, we worked with some kind of a traffic light. And this traffic light actually was green when there was a positive impact on the subsequent generation. And it turned red if people moved the slider away such that there was a negative impact on the subsequent generation. That's all what we did. People were free in their decisions. And let me tell you what we find. Indeed, we find much higher contributions to the long-term public good, such that short-term and long-term contributions did not anymore differ. They were on an equal level. Well, equal level, well, that's a way in the, in, in the direction we intended, but of course, it's not really uh, perfect. Yeah, of course, we want that people primarily contribute to the long-term public good. So we thought we could be do better or better, we thought that the participants could do better if we would provide them with another nudge. That's what we did. We gave them a text which read like an intergenerational contract. So it entailed uh, sentences like, I will not put the interests of my own group above the interests of the subsequent groups, or I will act solidarily toward the members of the subsequent groups. And now the participants had the possibility to agree or disagree with this statement. What is important is that there were no consequences of this agreement or disagreement. They could do whatever they want. And even if they agreed with it, afterwards they could decide however they would like to decide. And no other person would ever learn about their decision with this agreement. It's really just a pure self-commitment nudge in the way that it's only for yourself, but not signaling anything to someone else. So and indeed, with this additional nudge, first of all, what is important, we found what we have assumed, that most people are quite positive towards others, because nine of 10 people agreed with this statement. And what is probably more important is that afterwards, we found that those people who committed with this self-commitment nudge contributed significantly more to the long-term public good and much less to the short-term public good. So what I have tried to argue is that often it doesn't need a lot of know-how or a lot of technical equipment. Actually, people are not as bad as many people argue. In general, we all have, or most of us at least, 9 of 10 on average, uh, have positive attitudes uh, towards others and towards climate and pr uh, environmental protection. So simple nudges can actually help to uh, make people behave consistent with their own attitudes and preferences. So on the one hand, of course, they may make your candlelight dinner more romantic, but on the other hand, they may really help us to solve some of the most important challenges that we are facing, namely climate change. Of course, these nudges, they are really small peaks. They are no hammer blows, for sure not. However, we should use this possibility in order to be one step ahead in the fight against climate change. Thanks a lot.